Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank you for drifting in as we, uh, as we uh, re recuperate from the, the, uh, the running late session. I, I hate to tear you away all from the networking downstairs because to me that's always the best part of the conference. Um, but thank you and welcome to our session on the future of work. Um, as you've heard throughout the first day and a half of the, of the New Cities Foundation Summit, we've talked about cities, we've talked about public space, we've talked about the arts, we've talked about many of the things that make cities great. And the one thing we haven't really spoken about that much until now is work which is what we spend so much of our lives actually doing in spaces designed specifically for that, that purpose. And so the object of this session, which I hope will be wide ranging and will cover a lot of different grounds, is to look at, is to look at how notions of work are changing in cities, how our attitudes towards work are changing, and also how the, tri the typical notion of where work gets done, and by this I sort of mean white collar work, knowledge work, what we consider to be the most sort of productive and value adding work for cities, um, is moving out of the office into other forums. I mean, we have built, uh, what I find fascinating is, is that in the dense cores of our cities, uh, where we praise density and walkability, uh, we have built these massive structures known as office buildings, which are rarely full. Uh, there have been studies, for example, by the architect Frank Duffy that says that, that offices are only occupied 60% of the time at their peak, and much of the time, weekends and nights are empty. Um, and so how can we look at alternatives to activate uh, office space? How do we look at alternatives to the office itself, and, and how is work changing over there? So, so with us to discuss these sort of wide-ranging questions, um, I have with us, um, to my immediate left is uh, Ido Rocha, who is the founder of his eponymous uh, architecture firm, uh, uh, an architect here in Sao Paulo who is uh, who's working on, among other projects, uh, the Petrobas headquarters, 200,000 square meters. Um, so a man who is a, no stranger to designing and building office space. Um, to his left is, uh, is Corey Lowndes, who is the vice mayor of Rotterdam, um, which, as you may be familiar, of course, is one of the uh, smaller yet more famous uh, cities in the Netherlands, in the Randstad. Um, best known, as I was, I was telling her, as a, as a theme park for architects uh, who famously made it their home. Um, to her left is... Um, is um, uh, Lorenzo, uh, Lorenzo Bustani, who is the founder and CEO of, uh, of Mandela, which is sort of an innovation consultancy uh, that works with businesses to sort of uh, bridge the gap between uh, sort of social good and social purpose uh, and their own sort of, you know, business objectives. So he's essentially expanding the notion of stakeholdership to all. And then finally, to his left, um, is Eric Vandenbroek, Vandenbroek um, who is the co-founder of a co-working space in Paris, uh, Mutineri, uh, and then is also the creator of Copass, uh, which is one of the world's first sort of multi-city co-working networks. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with the notion of co-working, uh, I'll let Eric discuss, but it's the idea of working in spaces that are non-traditional offices with people who are your peers but not necessarily your colleagues. So you're working alone together is the classic way of saying it. And so there's really interesting developments uh, going on in these spaces. So, so with that, I will dive in. We'll ask, start asking our questions here. Please keep coming in and taking seats as you have the chance. Um, the first question I'd like to direct towards Ido, which is the notion of, you know, we have been building for a century now, essentially the office tower as we know it, you know, stacked vertical floors in the cores of cities, um, you know, even though work itself has changed. I mean, in the beginning, the office was a factory for pushing paperwork. Now we're trying to find new ways to collaborate and innovate. And so I was hoping you could talk a bit about, you know, sort of the relationship between the office and the city, this greater environment for collaboration and people, uh, and how your own work has changed and how you see sort of the office building evolving because you have more experience uh, than anyone else in this room with it. Uh, I don't know if I, s I start showing some image that I have. I know that image um, talk a little bit more than, uh, and I'm going to uh, explain a little bit more my experience, and in the middle, I will answer your question, okay? Good? So, um, I don't know if it's ready or not, okay? So, uh, basically, I start my uh, I, um, architecture looking for urban planning, but I couldn't do it. So then I start in another part that is architecture itself. It's not working. It's not working. Ah, okay. So uh, about, this is about uh, 25, 26 years ago. I'm uh, looking for uh, proposal some ideas for the Sao Paulo, so that's why I wanted to, to show you. It's, uh, uh, this train line was an uh, old train line done, done by the British on a, 
uh, last century, about uh, 1875, uh, 1890, something like that, and it's still there and is not used. And there is about more than 30 million square meter of uh, industries that are not used. And uh, in the beginning, I was uh, in the secretary of uh, planning for the, the government of Sao Paulo, and the idea is to move industry to the interior of the country and not to live in the inside of Sao Paulo. And, um, and, and so then I, I began to prepare this project. And um, um, we showed to the municipality, and just now, 25 years later, something are happening, something very, very small. And uh, this is something that I sometimes didn't trust on uh, ideas of a good, big changes of urban planning like this. So because this we change everything, we, we make an, a, a big area that you can work, live, have leisure, uh, culture, everything during all this line that is in the middle of the industrial line of the city that is a lot of empty spaces and we plan for all the um, stations and for instance this station is just a station for culture and music and so far so there is a, uh, we work for the whole city and unfortunately nothing happened okay so that's why I'm, I'm sometimes I'm a little bit disappointed about the government because the government uh, normally cannot do everything that they want and we saw some uh, very nice explanation about how difficult it for uh, putting together uh, the projects that the population need, right? So this is some of the ideas that happen during that time. But right now, what we are facing is a huge explosion of um, number of people and uh, the world is with a huge population and a lot of them come to the cities. But on the other hand, there are a lot of problems during the how nature is against us. Huh? It's, uh, uh, nature is not happy with what we are doing. And uh, uh, the most important and the most impressive is the amount of CO2 that we are producing. So we have here in the uh, image what uh, is the amount of tons of CO2 that the uh, United States and China and the rest of the world made in 2003 and what's happened in 2025. So we are in a big problem, not, not a small problem. We are in a huge problem about CO2. If we don't find a way, uh, some ideas, good ideas, to solve the problem, and this need to start in the city. So, in my opinion, about uh, sorry if it, because there's some of the slides are in Portuguese, but uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, sustainability. I understand that sustainability is only energy conservation and the conservation of electricity, water, our electricity that we have every day to, to work to. To. And the most important is, is how we can control CO2. If we've done these three things, we, are, we can start. If we don't, we cannot start. We cannot understand sustainability. And there is a lot of ways to minimize, to make it efficient. And this is basically the matrix that we're using in almost all our buildings. So the buildings need to be sustainable, need to be producing this own energy need to be efficient on that. And uh, because 48% uh, of the buildings that uh, consume the whole energy. So if we don't have these buildings efficient, there is no way to save energy and to have the energy in the conservation. But now, beginning to answer your question, I understand that is. Uh, in this century, we start with the office non-electric, then we start with electric, then we start electronic, now we are in a digital. We don't even know the amount of change we have on the 
digital and uh, probably on the holography and uh, it's going to be a big change. We are in the time that uh, uh, we don't know if the past can show us what to do in the future because we are really running in, with a lot of um, uh, change and I, I believe this is a big uh, situation. Some, uh, some time, some years ago, I designed this uh, working uh, space that I believe is going to be f uh, something on the future. It's about five years ago f or four years ago. And right now, maybe the iPad yeah. can do everything it's without uh, 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 a minimum of stuff. Why? Because uh, there is a lot of uh, changing on the use of this kind of uh, digital workspace. And I believe most of the companies didn't realize yet about this change. We are doing projects, we are doing office, we are doing companies that are still thinking in an old way. And we cannot move them to this new proposal. It's very difficult. They, they have a, a very strong uh, uh, connect to the past. So the smartphone, the, the fast uh, track on the information, there is a lot of uh, new technology that sometimes are very difficult to change the culture of the companies. And the companies, are, uh, they, move, they are moving much more fast, but they are still moving slowly in my point of view. So that's why I think that uh, we have a new model coming in. And uh, I cannot tell you what should be the next step, but what I'm saying is that we are in a, mo in a, in a mo movement of changing very fast. So uh, there is, a, uh, in the co-work, there is a lot of companies, let's say, that make together the co-work, the creation, the control, and how to compete. There are, let's say, the four types of companies that, that exist and how they manner their, their, their job. So there are different companies with different kinds of uh, uh, nature of work, and, but people still how they are. You know? So that's uh, basically is, uh, is in a moment of the big change on the, on the, because of digital. Okay. Well, well, thank you for that, because that's a, that's a great framing, I think, for this whole session there. And, and I think you hit two points in particular, which I thought were great. One is the sustainability aspect of this. I mean, we've basically built tremendous amounts of unsustainable infrastructure. I mean, my favorite example in New York, uh, you know, <coughs> one of the most famous, iconic office buildings, the Seagram building, designed by Mies van der Rohe and then copied endlessly, uh, was recently judged to be perhaps the least sustainable building in New York. <laughs> It's all plate glass and steel from the 1960s. It has no insulation. It's a disaster environmentally. And yet, this is the model that we have used for the office. Um, and the second point is you touched upon some various models of this. And I want to jump to Eric on this uh, to, to talk about one of these models, which is co-working, because I found it interesting that you designed a sort of cubicle of the future when co-working and other stuff is pointing to if I have a laptop, I can and will work from anywhere in any condition. So I, Eric, I would hope you could talk a bit about I guess sort of the co-working revolution and sort of the changes you've seen then and how people are approaching where and when and with whom they're working. Yeah, sure. So, so first, yes, the, uh, we, we came, the idea of, actually the, it wasn't even an idea of co-working, it was more like a need that we have because when, you, when, you're, when you're used to work, uh, and especially as a student, you know, you used to work with your laptop and everywhere and uh, you don't really understand, it's really a, a cultural shock. I don't really understand that you've got to, to come to an office and sit, sit at, a, at the same desk every day. And it's, that's, I think that's the first thing. Uh, combined with the fact that there's kind of a social contract that has been a bit broken between, I think, companies and uh, employees, and, and the curie that uh, companies provided you with is kind of an illusion today. Uh, you've, got, you've got, you know, uh, all the ingredients for, 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 for a change. And actually, the, the co-working space we created, so it's... it's it's based on, the, on that observation, on, on that gap between how companies could operate and how they kept on operating. Actually, it really, really was about that. And, uh, and so the thing is, 
you can work from virtually anywhere with a laptop and smartphone and even a tablet, or I, I don't know. The thing is, when you start to envision a future where you work on your own all the time, it just I think it sucks, you know. And the connected loneliness is not no better than corporate slavery when you think about it. Um, so, so the idea was, we still need places. We still need places to meet, to mate. Uh, and, and so the question was, what's the new role of these spaces? And for, for me, the new role was the, 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 the heart of these new spaces should be social interaction and collaboration because it's, it's how you build trust and, it's, and, and you need trust to build projects and to build big projects. And so the idea was, okay, so now if you strip the office of its just utility, like bringing capital and, and workforce on, on, the same, uh, on the same place, you know, what, what's, what's the, this new um, office space will look like? And, and so we had this idea of a collaborative space where independent workers, so it can be graphic designers, developers, journalists, consultants, startups, or medium-sized company can work. Um, so this, the, and most of all, the join a community of talents of, and of different, you know, different projects. And so we started doing that. We also thought that these places, uh, as they put the emphasis on the flow of ideas and, uh, and, of, and on diversity, they should also host lots of events. So we are also an event space. We, host, we hosted lots of different events, uh, <coughs> more than 100 through the last year. And um, some, some conferences, more, more, like more traditional conferences, but also crazy events like where, where people would come and peel vegetables to make a giant soup and, and dis uh, listening to electronic music, you know, it's like, and distributing to the streets. Uh, so it was very, very different spaces. And I think this, this is very interesting, the, the fact that uh, in, in a digital age, we still need places is something that really s struck me a lot. And, and, and you, don't, you, you cannot just say you, you can work from here. I think it would be like, it would be like um, really a mistake uh, to, 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 do, to do things like this. It would be very unproductive. So we still need offices, but a different kind. Of, and you don't need the same every day, I say. Well, with regards to that, I mean, how are, how are members using Copass as a network in cities? I mean, do you see people surfing across cities then from office to office to office during the day, depending on their mood, depending on how they use it? If we're not sitting in one place every day, how are we working? Do we keep the habits as students? Or what, what have you seen in terms of how people use co-working and use your spaces? So actually, I think most of, most of the people uh, have a mothership, what do we call a mothership. So they've got a place where, where, you, where they usually work most of the time. <laughs> but these people are by nature very, very flexible and mobile. And when you're an independent worker, and even in a company today, you're never really on holiday and uh, you're always a bit at work. And if you have to be at work, you can do it from nice places. That's, that's my take. I mean, it's more pleasant to receive a call from your boss at midnight if you're uh, close to the beach than if you're, uh, if you're in the same office building. You know, it's, it's, so that's, that's, the, that's the idea. So we, we see these people having a mothership and traveling a lot. Then there is another population of people that really are nomadic people. And they, I mean, it, the center of their life is, base, is, is mobility. They, they, they've constructed a lifestyle around mobility. And this is a tiny portion of the population but it, that is growing quite fast because the lifestyle is very appealing. I think people are really looking for experiences today more than just consumption, consumption of countries. You know, when you're a country, you just sit in a hotel and consume the beach and consume the local products and, and you know, people are looking for experiences. So it's, a, it's a kind of a slow way of traveling, like where, where, where you, you in a country, I, I, I came here three weeks before the meeting. I went to Rio and I worked from co-working spaces here and I, I, I like it. I, it wasn't really a holiday, it wasn't really work. I was discovering a new city and, and doing my job at the same time. And I think it's something that is gonna happen a lot in the future. People are asking for that. Great. Well, Lorenzo, I want to I want to riff off of that. You know, Eric mentioned uh, a social contract that you know once corporate slavery was the norm. Corporate slavery is what our parents' generation aspired to. It's certainly my parents. Um, and you know, when you work for the same employer your most of your entire life, and of course, there was all these assumptions built into the corporate model, built into the office model. And Lorenzo, I'd like you to talk, uh, I guess, a bit about how that social contract has changed. Uh, if that contract were still in place, there would be no such thing as co-working. We'd still be going to the office. So why is it that we're looking for multiple spaces? Why are we looking to engage at the city? And the other part of that I thought that Eric mentioned was interesting was, you know, is that to do large projects, you need trust. 
you know, doing solo work, floating around the city or working in small spaces is one thing. How do we build organizations that can really sort of sure. do that? You know, how do we build larger purpose out of it? You work with some of the biggest companies out there, Nike and others. Um, so how do you see that new model of work working with large scale projects and large scale companies? Great. So good morning. Thanks for having me here. Thanks everyone for being here as well. Um, I think there, there are different ways you can, you can answer that question, right? I think uh, the social contract, it, it's, 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 been, it's being reconfigured as we speak, uh, partly because of changes in the corporation, but partly because of behavioral changes as well uh, from the people who work. So I think um, from an existential perspective, I think a lot of people are asking themselves, to what extent is my work aligned uh, with my values, with things that I'm genuinely interested in? And when people ask themselves that, they realize that there's a certain amount of uh, dissonance between their view of the world and their personal values uh, and those that they're defending, in a sense, when they're working for a corporation. So that changes the nature of work as well because it changes the nature of what you are willing to do over time. And I think that for a long time, people were just um, robots, an automatic pilot, and they were just uh, following protocols uh, which were imposed top-down in very hierarchical command and control structures. And that's clearly changing because we're starting to understand that that's just not coherent, that's just not sustainable. So I think from an existential perspective, we have this major shift that's, that's underway. Um, from a functional perspective as well, um, I think a lot of people are asking themselves to, you know, how expensive and how time consuming is it getting to travel from point A to point B? So there's this tremendous amount of pressure for employees to produce, and yet they have less time to produce. And it's also becoming somewhat economically inefficient as well uh, for corporations to sustain a huge workforce that spends maybe an hour and a half, two hours in Sao Paulo uh, getting to and from work. So from an efficiency point of view, I think uh, there are also some deep, deep implications. Now, one thing that we didn't talk about, which I think is extremely relevant, is the extent to which these traditional workplaces are actually helping the market become more creative. Because these structures, um, they don't uh, foster a spirit of creativity. Uh, much on the contrary. Uh, they inhibit uh, different cognitive connections so that you can come up, arrive at different alternative scenarios for the work that you're actually producing. So it's actually in the best interest of corporations to allow their employees to mingle in other types of environments that are inspirational and that will help them uh, tap into their creative side. If not, again, we're in this uh, modus operandi where uh, we're just following rules and protocols and we're not really... Uh, uh, tapping into our own intellectual uh, repertoire in order to, to produce what we're expected to produce. Um, now, how do organizations do that? Um, some large corporations have realized that um, they're so big that it's very hard to be creative and innovative and to have a workforce that's happy with the working environment. So um, what they've done is they've created these silos within uh, the larger organizational structure um, that operate under very different rituals and protocols. These organizations are called ambidextrous organizations. They're organizations that are huge uh, and that have uh, all the inertia, which is very characteristic of these large organizations, but they have smaller uh, groups which are detached from the physical environment of this large organization where you dress differently, where the ambiance is different as well, where the working hours are different, uh, and where the teams are much more multidisciplinary or even transdisciplinary. Uh, so that's that's an uh, up and coming trend in in these larger corporations. That's great. Well, I, moving beyond the corporation, I want to go to the city because I think it's very interesting that traditionally cities, when it comes to uh, attracting businesses and attracting workers, you know, the traditional model was to throw a lot of incentives and encourage a very large corporation to move its headquarters or some piece there. Uh, and then, you know, cities and their economic development officials would declare victory. Uh, and then, of course, those cities would be lured away by somebody else in this ongoing process. Um, I, I was hoping to ask, Corey, I'm, I'm curious about how Rotterdam is trying to do things differently by encouraging actual workers and activating part of urban space. What can cities do to encourage this new shift of work? What policies can you pursue? Uh, how can you help people? And how do you reactivate sort of these, you know, parts of the urban fabric that are, de that are dead, old, old forms of work, old factories, everything else. So what can the city do to, to encourage this? Well, just let me start by, by, by saying that the old economy is still very strong and it's still there. Because if you look at the amount of jobs involved in the old economy, it's, it's a reality. And you, you can't, of course, you have to think for the future, but you also have to realize what's happening today and what people need today and not only tomorrow. Um, I don't know whether I can I have some pictures just to... This is, of course, what, you, what Rotterdam is famous for, for the port. We, ha we, ha we have a big port. 
And one of the things we are aiming for is not only to be, not to become or, or, uh, the biggest port of the world. We used to be the biggest, <coughs> we're not anymore. We want to be the more, most sustainable port in the world. So we're shifting now to a different um, way of work, different uh, competences needed, and more ICT-based components, for instance, if you just look at sustainability and making the best of, of what you can do in a sustainable way. And the same goes for the, um, uh, for the care sector, which is also a big sector when it comes to, in the, to the Netherlands. Uh, an increasing demand for new cure and care technologies, but also more and more personalized. So we have to rethink the whole structure of the cure and care sector as well in the city is getting more and more do-it-yourself care. We don't want to spe spend so much money on it anymore. So um, it has to do with taxes as well. I'm not sure whether this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the second part we're working hard on, and the third. Uh, economic sector of quite some importance are the services and you can see that in, a, in the cities it's getting more and more personalized and it's going local actually if you just look at what people want they want it at the moment they want it and they wanted it close by they wanted it nearby they don't want to wait for it they want to have it just in an instant and um, well I can re really easily relate to what, what Renz just said that the big companies actually work closely together to transform uh, to make their transform transitions from the one sector to the other one. So we have a lot of young pro professional networks working together on issues together from the different sectors with universities, with applied services. So it's, well, it's, it's, it's building up new ways actually in, in doing business in the, in the city as well. Um, but also involving youngsters at a lower skill level because that's one of the main problems we have. We have a lot of people trained for communication services, social services, but we have a lack of technical people, technical skilled people. So one way, one thing we do is actually building a tech shop. It's uh, it's in a, in a former part of the, of the harbor, uh, of no use anymore. In really involving young people with businesses in building new products like electric scooters, for instance, or 3D printers, using in all kind of new products to involve them and to interest them in in technical skills. Um, so this is just one way to 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 produce uh, some novelties. And this is the last slide I wanted to show because it says a lot about how you should also rethink urban planning in a city like Rotterdam. It was bombarded uh, in the Second World War, so we had this center full empty and we had this top-down plan. We had a lot of nice architects uh, coming in and b building these wonderful buildings, uh, skyscrapers in, in the city. But they're not linked to each other. Um, and two architects actually... Um, they, they went into a, a, a completely sp uh, empty uh, office building near the central station. Um, and they really tried to transform it into a working place for all different persons who want to be creative on any subject, actually. And there were just two of them in this really dreadful old um, uh, office building, and it was uh, at the list to, uh, to, to demolish. But thanks to the crisis, um, we didn't have the, the money to, to really demolish it, so it was really standing there. So it, then they took the time, they used it very wisely, they transformed the complete building into opening it up, and a lot of different uh, new startups are now in this building. But it was not enough for them, because they are architects, they wanted to make new connections between the buildings and between different neighborhoods, especially um, from the center to the northern part of, uh, of the town. And they came up with this idea of this wooden bridge you see, um, with all kinds of parks just alongside, and they involve everybody living in these neighborhoods, coming from Turkish minorities who want to have a space to, to barbecue in, in their own way, to a, a discotheque who wanted to have a public space uh, with uh, other people mingling. So it's, they build it up very, very slowly, so you have to be patient because it's bottom up and they involve a lot of people. Um, and actually you can see that it's there also uh, the response in the city to these kind of projects. It's, it's also, it's not only um, positive, we all receive a lot of negative uh, impulses as well because it's so new. Not everybody relates to this new way of thinking and this new way of working. So I think it's important to involve a lot of people um, in, in really getting it slowly done it's not something you can do easily just in one day or two days. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, one question I guess I want to sort of, that comes out of this, out of the sort of opening, opening discussions here is a discussion, you know, the discussion of the need for multiple spaces, the discussion of uh, all these sorts of uses across the city. 
and yet, you know, workers, of course, still, you know, pushing back against, you know, Edo's clients pushing back against him on, on wanting to do things traditionally. I guess the way of asking is, you know, has the office building as we know it kind of failed? Uh, and I mean this as a, as a provocative question in the sense of, as Lorenzo hit the nail on the head there, you know, companies are looking, to, looking for multiple spaces in which people can be creative. And the office, as Ido pointed out, you know, it was, it was designed in a pre-electrified age where they were. They were factories for moving paper around because we did not have the communication tools to do that necessarily. So a question for the panelists is, is can we design the space for work? Do we have to find the spaces in which that we're most comfortable in doing work? Or can we set out to design, as you tried to, a better cubicle in this? Because I think of another example of this was in London uh, last fall, you know, Boris Johnson, the mayor, uh, announced that in Silicon Roundabout, you know, their neighborhood where all the technology companies are, they would spend 50 million pounds on building this big white glass cube. That would be the sort of technology hub for the entire Silicon Roundabout. The reaction of all the technology companies there was something that mixed between horror and disgust uh, that they would drop this because they find they, they do their best work in little old offices and the pubs and meeting each other on the street. And so I guess one question for the panelists is, is how do we have more of the latter? How do we design neighborhoods or how do we encourage neighborhoods and design these spaces where people can meet that aren't over designed, that aren't these sort of horrible offices? I don't know if anyone would like to jump in here, but this, yep, to me, please. please. Well, this, I think that's one thing we have to learn. It's, it's not so much about these big <coughs> plans. You can plan ahead for five or 10 years. You have to be more flexible and you have to be in tune what's happening in the city and, and what ideas people come up with themselves and make sure that you're not in the way. And it's a complete different role for governments because we are used to being the one who's, the, who's, who's calling the shots. And we're not, well, you can, you can easily argue whether we, whether, we have F, whether we had this seat, but still, if you look at this time now, you have to, you have to come up with different sort of partnerships. We're not calling the shots anymore. Anyone else? No, no, I just, ju just think that um, uh, um, the, the, the primary message of, mut of mutinery, which actually means mutiny in English, is, is not just that everybody's going to work this way. Like, yeah. uh, it, it's not that. It's, it's just about uh, do you like what you're doing on a day-to-day -day <coughs> basis? I, I, just, I think we need companies uh, a lot. We need companies more, more than ever. Uh, it's, not, it's not the problem. I think maybe 30 or 40 percent of the population is going to work from this new kind of spaces. But what I think is that the impact of what we are learning through co-working is a lot greater than just co-working spaces. It's just that um, I think companies are going to get inspired by this new way of working. And maybe instead of building just one big building, they're going to build a hub uh, around which employees would gravitate. So they would come here to fine tune the vision, to share the ideas that they've been collecting in different ideas, in different places, uh, meeting different people. But they would come here to make some meetings and to, and to discuss the company vision and, and the company essence. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, uh, headquarters that maybe can hold 30, 40 percent of the workforce because um, most of the time the workforce is split on different spaces. You still need these moments of, of you know, when, when people come together and, and, and share things. It's just, it's just that the function is different and, and, and the, the emphasis should be put on the social interaction and how people socialize and get to know each other in the office rather than just the production of the work that can be split and produced all over the planet. Well, this, well, go ahead. And, and just to add on that, I think um, the office building was very appropriate for the industrial area, right, where you wanted to group as many people together as possible, put everyone on an assembly line, and try to get as much output as possible. But <coughs> what that caused was a certain disconnection between the office environment and the world outside the office. So you had huge corporations investing billions of dollars in products and services that are completely disconnected with our, with our realities. 90% uh, of products and services that are commercialized globally, they don't stay in the market for more than one year. So you have to ask yourselves, what is driving the innovation and the research and development in these corporations? And my hypothesis is that because people are so sheltered from the real world, they're investing in ideas and in products and services that just don't resonate with us. So I think we're facing new challenges as a society and we need to make these people more human and we need to connect them with their clients in a much more authentic way. 
I think, I think unintentionally that was the best indictment of Silicon Valley I've heard recently, designing products in a little bubble. Um, well, one question to that is, it seems to be a given of everyone on this panel um, that you know, the, the, future of, the future of work is inherently social and inherently about proximity, which is, is interesting to me because you know, the, this was always assumed that cities were a relic of, of, uh, of a lack of telecommunications. I mean, uh, Marshall McLuhan in 1970 famously declared that cities would die in the electric age. Uh, in 1995, George Gilder, a Silicon Valley prophet, declared that cities were, again, the sort of uh, the, the, the burnt out hulks of uh, factories. They, you know, essentially they would go away because we would have infinite bandwidth to do anything. And, you know, with apologies to anyone from Cisco in this room, there's still a very, you know, very large technology presence that is betting on telepresence and video as a major collaboration tool. Um, I'd be curious if anyone, what, what anyone on stage thinks about what is going to be the role of these technologies in this? It's going to serve some function, but none of us believe that you know cities are going away or that the need to be together is going away. Yeah, uh, can I please? Uh, it's a it's a very uh, uh, challenging mov movement. Uh, we have a lot of types of work. Okay, we cannot compare. There is not one solution for uh, mm. a miracle solution for one type of work. So there is many uh, types of, uh, and the city, and the type of the city that we are uh, living in are designed in the past and not probably uh, really organized in a, in a sense that can facilitate our life. So that's, that's the big problem. Uh, looking for old cities or small communities, you see that uh, they are working very well, okay, and people are happy there. So, in my point of view, even living on the city and working on the city, probably, and what we are seeing right now, and we see in some of the uh, solution in Singapore and some other places, is to repeat this model and create a, a model that is, uh, let's say, a compact, most popular city in just one block. Mm -hmm. So, and repeat this um, in many other places, in many parts of the city. This is what I'm thinking is, looks like the future, okay? But all the predictions that everybody done in the past, and you see that, nothing happened. They told that the world is going to finish uh, some months ago no. and didn't happen, so we're still here. <laughs> so everybody predicts some things that in the way or the other uh, moving around. So we are a creative uh, um, uh, animal, okay? And uh, we are accustomed to, to change our mood, to change our way of live, and to uh, change our way to work. I'm very impressed with uh, my uh, uh, grandson that with uh, one and a half year already take the telephone and things. So this is so, uh, the digital uh, technology is part of the, his life. So we don't know yet what's going on on the mind of the all the human beings, so it's, it's a changing. And I, I believe that also, as you say, that the companies uh, make service, make works, didn't last. That's why, uh, the, the, that's the challenging. So there's a lot of different types of work. I can guarantee that it, here, that everybody works in a different, not in a different way, but it has different uh, uh, way to works. And even in a big company or even in a small company, they, if you don't have a rule, you have a way to be more creative. You know? Please. Well, it's not only about technology, it's also about responding to technology in a quite different way. If I look at the popularity now of having beehives in the center of the city, of, of having urban farming in, 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 in small plots, actually, in, uh, in, in highly urbanized uh, uh, surroundings, then you see that people respond in a way, in, in very many different ways, actually, and doing it at the same time by using their iPad, their iPhone, and, and, and then having an hour in spending time with their beehive. So it's, it's, it's all, all, all true. Yeah. yeah. I uh, go. No, 
I said the problem with predictions and, and provisions is that it tends to be too romantic. You know, to, to, to make the headlines, you've got to predict that everything's going to change and the work is going to die. And it, no. it, it's, it's just not, the, the reality is a lot more complex than that, actually. It's just, when, you, when you're doing co-working and you've got lots of people asking you questions and they, they, they want you to say that everybody's going to work this way. Like, they're really, like, it's really like... I'm trying to get you to say <laughs> that. <laughs> no, no, you, you didn't try. But. Uh, no, no, but it's it's you know it's it's romantic to say that, and it's it's but it, actually the reality is that I think what's important is to have a certain attitude when you when when things are changing so fast, when 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 all the tools we're using did not exist even ten years ago, you cannot ma make any good prediction. The only thing you can do is to is to is to manage a certain a certain uncertainty through a certain attitude toward what's happening and toward things, and 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 I think being being networked to a lot of people helps you doing that because it offers you a lot of options. And, and then you navigate into, you know, into the unknown and you try to identify what, where, where you should go next, next year. I, I never did a plane more than, you know, with a forecast more than two years in the future because otherwise I don't know. No. Well, one, one question for, for you and, and Lorenzo quickly. And Lorenzo, if you want to take this first. I, you know, I'd be remiss. We can't, this can't be a conference in 2013 if I don't ask about 3D printing. We just have to. Um, and this sort of ties into sort of Corey's point about urban agriculture as well. It, it's interesting, you know, of course, that you know, in the U.S. in particular, cities nearly died in the 60s and 70s because of deindustrialization, and we moved out all of the factories out of it. And then, of course, you know, then we had post-industrial cities, which was all going to be based on knowledge work, which is what we've talked about. With, if you have a laptop, you can do work. But now there's, of course, this whole policy emphasis on how do we bring back manufacturing into the city of war because we realize we need to have a manufacturing base for this. So I'd be curious, the two, we were discussing this a bit beforehand, if you have any thoughts in particular on actually sort of penetration of 3D printing. How will 3D printing and manufacturing, distributed manufacturing in the city, actually look at scale? Because right now we have all sorts of really cute projects and we've talked a lot about, you know, make, we have, we have maker spaces and, and tech shops. Um, you know, do you have any particular visions on how this could scale up into a new form of urban manufacturing? I, Lorenzo, if you want to take it, I'd like to hear Eric too. I think it's extremely dramatic. I think even though 3D printing is uh, at, at the beginning of its, of, its, of its journey, I think it definitely has uh, the capacity to shift the, uh, the, the, the power balance between uh, those who consume and those who produce because basically 3D printing uh, brings the power back to the, the consumer in a sense, right? Uh, in this do-it-yourself kind of, kind of model. So I think it has tremendously dramatic implications. Um, the question is, there are certain technologies that are embedded in 3D printing, like coding, like broadband eventually, and things like that, that also need to be developing at the same pace. And I think uh, the extent to which those, all those technologies, they evolve together, uh, that's when we're going to see things tr really shifting. Well, I, I think 3D printing is uh, also going to impact like, really largely how things are done. Not everything, not everything at all. But um, I see some very concrete applications, for instance, on um, maintenance and reparation of things. For instance, you, you, break, you break a part of your bike, maybe you can you know, print it. Uh, you can imagine some, uh, some washing machines where the suppliers would just put all the parts online, and when you break something, you can print it. So I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to have some implications. It's going to be surely a two-tier system, a bit like the normal printing, actually. Maybe you've got one uh, at home like uh, that can do minor things like fixing handles and fixing your bike, and maybe when you got to go to a larger scale, then you 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 talk to professional 3D printers to 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 print really like like I don't know you can even print chairs or or whatever. What is really interesting I think is for modern economies is that it can really be relocated in uh, in in you know in occidental countries in the West countries I'd say um, because it's kind of automatic and requires you know a high degree of of, of knowledge and that's that's really interesting in terms of uh, in an ecological point of view to limit transportations of goods and materials uh, if the material is improved so that it's really 100 percent re recyclable then then you can really start to have something that is really interesting we're still gonna need some uh, some industry you still need steel and so on but i think it's gonna have some drastic impact on, on, on lots of small things, but important things in your life. Um, one last question. Uh, 
Corey wanted, to suppose, uh, Corey wanted to ask you a question before we go to audience Q&A, I guess on sort of the big picture about um, uh, diversity in workforces. I mean, this is one of the things that's been really interesting is that over time, um, I, I think I have a personal theory that I think one reason corporations have embraced diversity is because they understand that if you want to innovate, you have to have as many diverse, multiple intellectual viewpoints as possible too. There's a very good reason why they've done that. And this is playing out politically very, in very interesting ways. In the United States, for example, there's the whole battle over the H-1B visa where the Silicon Valley companies want access to the world's best engineers and they want it on the cheap. And there's a whole fight about that. I know this is a particular an issue for Rotterdam and the Netherlands in general with, with that. And so how do you, you know, how do you actually build a, an integrative, into, fully integrated workforce in the city as opposed to trying to cherry pick the world's talent, which I think when it comes to work, that's most cities' immigration strategy is how do we just simply cherry pick either within our own region or country or then overseas as well? Well, before, before I can answer, I think I have to explain something. If you just look at the population in Rotterdam, then almost half of the population has a bicultural background. So partly Moroccan, partly Turkish, partly entails, partly Suriname. So we have the diversity in our own city. And you can really ask yourself, who's integrating into who? Uh, because it's a total new uh, um, uh, sum up of the population already there. And if, it also causes, of course, a lot of questions about what is the Dutch nationality. And people relate more easy, actually, to the city. They feel more belonging to Rotterdam, feeling Rotterdammer, than they belong to, to, to the Netherlands. Um, because they also belong to Turkey or to Morocco or, or any other country, actually. So, so migration is now a hot issue uh, in, in the European Union, but also outside the European Union. And I think we have to come up with solutions like well, we see in a lot of other countries actually happening around the world in, in, in really facilitate migration at a, big, at a higher level. But I don't think it will come up very easily because in a political uh, arena, it's, uh, well, it's highly debated and highly discussed. Actually, one last question for you before we go to q and you know, As an architect, of course, you're constantly constrained by your clients. You can't force ideas on them. You can only try to suggest. My question is, if you had to design an ideal workspace beyond just the desk you designed, what would it look like? What would be, from your perspective, the, the ideal place to do work if you could get your clients to go along with anything? Uh, okay. As I told you, there is many kinds of companies. Yes. Uh, it's different if you're doing a bank or a lawyer office or a technology company. Um, um, the other day, they asked me, okay, no, this is... Uh, uh, office of uh, Google, how you think that? Oh, it's nice because his color is creative. Uh, and we need uh, foosball tables and we need, you know, games. Yes, yes games, and slides. That, that's not, okay, so let's put this in the office of a lawyer office and propose that. What's happened? You go into the lawyer's office, say, okay, I'm not going to contract this guy because this is not the same thing that match. So there is not one way. As I told you, there are uh, maybe four types of companies. The creative, the collaborative, uh, so uh, uh, companies that are uh, producing things together and things in company that has to invent things, okay? So these four types maybe is just in one company, but sometimes are different companies that uh, has to do different types of work. So you have to, let's say, put a, a good uh, um, way to make these companies get work. No. Okay, so big corporate, big corporates, uh, maybe sometimes has <coughs> different uh, thinking about what is their culture, what they want, what they want from the employees, and you have to follow some of those rules, and you propose some of the what's coming up, what is the new, what is the new solution for technology. But I believe that uh, some companies don't want to invent too much, okay? Because there is some risks of uh, changing too much. So they manage this uh, changing with a little caution. So it's not, uh, okay, let's go to make an office equal to Google because that's the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. That's just, uh, There's still plenty of people who think that, however. Yeah. No. This is, uh, playground is one thing. Uh, technology is another. Uh, you know, everything is a little bit different from one company to yeah. the other. No? Great. Uh, opening up now to audience questions. Does anyone have a question? Would anyone like to ask <coughs> anything? Uh, I see one in the back and then one in the front. So we'll get these two first and then over All here. Right. 
My name is Alessandro Esmopato. I'm an architect from Sao Paulo. Uh, I, I think we're talking about here is how, how work means for different companies, as Edu Rocha told us. Because I, I, I think there is a, a mood of faking in this area, because everyone, every company need, uh, fakes that, oh, we, we, we want innovation and we want new ideas, but we don't want to change anything. And uh, people fake that they are uh, proactive and interested in the company and they are having a misery day. So, uh, in fact, when you, have, when you choose people in your office to have lunch, it's not people you like most, but you, it's people you hate less, mostly. Uh, so, uh, the, the environment, uh, it's, it's fundamental to, to, you know, it's a symbol of what happens and uh, builds up what, uh, what work means to people. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and we are privileged in this, uh, in this matter because we're talking about works with ideas, mostly. And, but we still have uh, uh, factories, factories to design that are disattached to this uh, uh, environment that we're talking about. And uh, they're getting uh, more and more separated to, to this. We, we're we're uh, se separating all, completely all the, the, the subject. Uh, because we can we can be uh, offices now. If you if you go to the street, connected, you you yeah. can uh, have an office. So my, my question is, uh, uh, how how uh, and for Lorenzo especially, uh, do, do you believe that uh, uh, companies can can be split up in in different in, in small pieces uh, around the city and also for for Carrillo's too? Uh, to, to be more uh, flexible to, uh, for, for example, it's for mobility also, for yeah. not making people uh, travel so much. Yeah, I think it's, it's no longer a matter of whether they're capable or not. Uh, they must. I think the, the, the traditional models, they're already overdue. They're, they're done with. Uh, we now have to help organizations uh, take the first few steps in the direction of something which is radically different. So... You're absolutely right in saying that the environment uh, is very conducive to the culture of the organization. And we have new cultures that are emerging now, uh, new cultures that are based on more collaborative work, uh, more transdisciplinary work. And so if the environments don't correspond to that, like you said, there's an incoherence between what these leaders expect from their, from, from their workforce and the types of environments that they, that they provide for them. Now, I think that, uh, granted, Granted, factories, when you go into a factory, you really ask yourself, you know, to what extent is this at the service of creativity, well-being, and just an overall, you know, quality of, quality of life. I think even in those kinds of environments, it's very possible for you to ritualize certain things and introduce certain protocols that make the spirit of that place somewhat different, right? Obviously, when you're working in a startup environment, it's very easy to innovate. You can, you, know, you can have a, a Google type of environment. But when you're in a, in a place that employs maybe 10, 15,000 people who go to work every day, it's harder to do that. But it's not impossible. And that's the point. Sometimes it's the conjunction of a few very minor things that together create a different type of environment and a different type of culture. So I think it's, 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 it's long overdue. Companies need to do this. We have another question up here in the front. And, just, uh, and it, 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 it's happening oh, also. Yeah, because you asked me... Um, what are the experience in Rotterdam? It's happening also. Big, big companies, they turn into new offices, uh, small offices in the center of the city. Um, and they used to have these big offices just at the, at, the, at the surroundings of the city. So it's happening already. And I totally agree with Lorenzo. They need to. It's, it's, it's not a question. It's only a question how to. And, and can they really speed up? Because they have to do it faster than they can, actually. Let's, let me just add that. It's, it's an economic issue, really. Productivity is down. Inefficiencies are high, turnover is high. People are disenchanted with their workforce, with their work. There's a, a very interesting statistic that in the U.S., work <coughs> has a 20% approval rating. 20%. That's one of every five people actually are engaged with what they do. That's that's very worrisome. Please, we have a question here in front. Hello, my name is Luis, and I'm an architect. 
I live close to Sao Paulo. And my, my question is, I mean, we, we do see that office buildings are changing and mostly due to the change in, in the need. Uh, we've got new technologies, we've got uh, new um, possibilities. And if we get down to earth on this, we will find out that um, most of what we do today is exchange information. So uh, when we design uh, nicer offices, we're actually looking for more productivity, um, and we, want, we don't really think, maybe, as a side effect, we'll have happy collaborators and workers, but uh, probably what we're looking at is uh, the need to become more efficient. What I would like to know is if any of you have any, any uh, uh, previous experiences that you'd like to share with us related to public buildings, uh, because uh, municipalities and uh, public buildings don't really have to be competitive. They own the market, or their market. <laughs> Do any of you have any experience on that? I think Corey is perfect for this question. <laughs> Yes, actually, we're now building the, the largest um, office space in, in Rotterdam. And it's a wonderful design by Rem Koolhaas of uh, Oma Architects. Um, and it's, 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 it's meant to be for the people working for the municipality. <laughs> and at the same time, um, we have a lot of experiments going on in the city where people from the municipality are not working in their official places anymore, but they work just anywhere in the city, spread it around. So we have both uh, ways actually at, at, at the moment so I think that's 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 a wonderful feature of the transition we are now into because we don't know where what 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 will the end what will be the goal of it at the end of it so it's uh, it's happening at the same time yeah I, I would just I would just argue that whether you're a public servant or a private employee essentially you still want to feel good about the place that you work at so more important than being competitive is having a workforce that goes to work happily and leaves the office happily as well we had a question over there, and then we'll, there was someone over here, and we'll go for Hi, Robert Barnard with uh, Youthful Cities. Uh, we're ranking the top 25, or the, some of the biggest cities in the world from a youth perspective. And when you talk to young people, sort of 15 to 29-year-olds, one of the key things they're looking for in cities is a great place to work. So the question to the panel is, is it actually flipping over where it used to be youth had to scream and shout to get places to think about them? Is it now moving into the to a place where youth are now the competitive advantage for cities and the cities that do the best job at creating uh, places, creating opportunities, inspiring entrepreneurship are going to actually bring the best youth to those cities, thereby creating the cities of the future? Yes, I think so. That I think your hypothesis is absolutely right. I think to the extent that these cities foster a spirit of innovation and that allow people, allow young people to work collaboratively with distributive power uh, embedded in this, in this culture where these technologies are at the service of people's lives, I think, yeah, of course, that's going to be very attractive for millennials and for generation, for the Gen Y people. Maybe, maybe one something that I would um, add is that I, I've heard a lot during this uh, all meeting the idea of competition between cities and like who's going to attract the most young, young people and who's going to attract the more jobs and I mean it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a reality but they, we talk a, quite few about the corporate, cooperation about between this collaboration between these cities and we are, yet we are all here exchanging ideas you know, trying to do things uh, together in the different cities and I think it's really important I mean I, th f f f I see myself as going from I was living in different cities in my lifetime and I like that these cities are different, offering different things. I like that they've got a specific vibe, like there is a vibe in Sao Paulo that, I, that is not the same than in Rio, that is not the same than in, in Paris, not the same in Berlin. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's something valuable. But yes, you've got to have this frame, you've got to have these infrastructures that <coughs> allow you to navigate quite easily to find a community, to, to find some energy. I think the most important thing is to vehicle energy for these young people and opportunities for these, these young people. Then the rest like, can vary, like the, the vibe and, and, and the culture is going to be different. That's really good. And I think these young people are looking for experience above all. So you have, as a city, to provide certain experience, but not has to be the same everywhere. 
Yeah. Oh. Can another, I say something? Yeah, please. We have another question over here. Does someone have a hand? Well, we, we've, we've done a lot of work actually in working together with different European cities, uh, especially amongst youngsters. Yeah. And it's it's getting uh, it's getting a movement. It started just by by some projects, and it's now really starting into a new movement actually within Europe, and they also relate to cities outside of Europe as well. So I think you're quite right, but it, the characteristics of every city is different. You, it, but you have to be able to describe. What the, correct, correct, what the character is of your own city, and that have to relate to what youngsters are seeking for. They have to, but have to make some, have to be plausible. Oh, all right. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Natalia. I'm a journalist. Uh, we spoke about the future of work uh, in people's scale and companies' scale. I would like to ask your opinion about where will money come from in this future? Is, is this changing? I mean, there are lots of crowdfunded projects in Brazil nowadays. I, I know that there is a bridge crowdfunded in Rotterdam as well. Is this going to change as well and how in your opinion? Well, it was actually the bridge I showed you in the picture, and you can everybody in the audience can buy a, a plank in this bridge in, in the second part of it for 25 euros. You have your name engraved in, in Rotterdam for the rest of your life, so <laughs> it's it's still going on. But I think what's more interesting is not the crowd crowdfunding part, but it's the crowdsourcing part. It's not about the money anymore. It's about exchanging services. It's it's about really into getting community services as well. Um, it, at neighborhood level, but also beyond neighborhood level. And it will really reshape also cities in the future. I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced. It's not only about money anymore. The, the question I've got with crowdfunding is, we, I mean, I, I love it. We did lots of things about crowdfunding in our, in our uh, space. The thing is, I'm wondering about the scale that you can have uh, with crowdfunding. And, uh, to which extent can you... Uh, first, it applies to a certain type of project that has to be a bit sexy. It like, has to be a bit... Uh, like you know, you got to, you got to. It's got, it has to appeal to people, and there are some things that are not appealing at all, but are very useful. <laughs> that's uh, that's the first thing. So, how do you finance this kind of stuffs, like the clean water system? You know, it's uh, it's not very sexy, but it's very important. Uh, and then the the other thing is the the scale. Uh, the big projects that I've been that I've on on uh, that I've collected on Kickstarter, lots of money like 25 million or something like this were actually projects that, that were already financed or already made a step you know further or if they didn't they had to have a magnificent communication campaign that requires some money so it, it i mean it helps for a lot of things it, it helps to kickstart some things but at a certain point it's it's not the one and one fits all solution i guess other questions you still have one over here uh, hi, uh, my name is Ash Mishra. I'm an SME operating in Asia and in Europe. And uh, my question is this, is this not really about um, the culture of, of work in the sense of an organization? What are the values that are really important? For example, if you're a company and you want to be sustainable and you want to last the next 10 years, you want to engender trust in your employees. You want to build values within the company that allows you to survive. But your model presumably is driven by the nature of the contract. In other words, people just come in and out of work. So how does a firm survive uh, in this environment? And the second part is, we're getting older. We're living longer. And yet in other parts of the world, we have baby booms. Neither one of those strategies seems to fit into this formula. So what do you think? I'd like to take the first half of that question because I think there's some very interesting experiments uh, underway in that, in that regard. And perhaps the most interesting one is uh, taking place in Las Vegas where Zappos, the, uh, the online retailer, is essentially trying to merge with the city. It is a company that is going to move its headquarters into the former city hall and the, the founder of Zappos, who sold out to Amazon, is taking his personal fortune and building an ecosystem of startups and services and small businesses and charter schools and is essentially funding a mini city in the middle of downtown Las Vegas, away from the casinos, uh, to sort of serve his company and serve the, the, the surrounding residents. And it's very curious how that will turn out because he's, he's very explicitly doing this because he realizes there's limits to what the corporation can do and last. He's trying to build a larger 
ecosystem around it that can nourish and cultivate and help his company grow beyond just living in a suburban office park, which is where they are now. I think this could be very good for a company. What I'm very hesitant about is what this means for the city, because they're essentially building a startup city, as he would tell you, and it acts and it looks like a startup. And it's very sort of purpose-driven. It's not the open-ended cities where everyone gets to do what it is they love. And so that's, that's sort of one response to that sort of thing in terms of applying a culture directly onto a city and a place. The second part, I don't know if the panelists have, have anything on that, but, but that, that immediately is what I thought of with your first part yes. of the question. Um, <clears throat> what I can tell you about uh, sustainability and how the companies are worried about that is that uh, uh, right now in Brazil, uh, the good news is there is a lot of worry about sustainability. So I think that's the first step. They are uh, really uh, worry about uh, sustainability. They want to do things that... Uh, so this is a driven, uh, very important right now. So it's, a, it's a beginning a big movement about that. They are worried about that. And so that's I think, is the first step to start thinking about what your proposal are. You know, so if you don't have this, we don't have even the company who in, is interest on on moving. But there's a lot of companies who are changing some way of working, some way of uh, having the the driving the how to take care of the, the 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 people. The problem is there is a lot of laws in Brazil that complicates a lot of ways to work, and that's probably one of the part that is non-creativity in the sense that we want, okay? So the, the laws in Brazil to uh, hire uh, employees are very complicated, okay? So that's why probably we are, let's say, 1945, okay? And, and, and that is a problem, okay? That's the experience in Brazil. If I, can t if I can take two of the words that you used and then be a bit provocative. You talked about values and you talked about sustainability. In a... 30 to 50 year time projection, I think when we talk about the future of work and values and sustainability, we can come to the conclusion that the future of work is non-work. Because if we can find a way to engage ourselves in things that we actually love to do, then perhaps we'll be resignifying what work is. And it will no longer be seen as a sacrifice. Somewhere where we need to go for 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day before we can then switch off and be the normal people that we like to be. So if we can align work with life in a projection of 30 to 50 years, I think that's sustainability. It's doing something that you're passionate about, that you believe in, and that helps you evolve as a human being. The other thing that I would add is I, I find it strange. That, I mean, values are the most important thing that a company has to offer. And I think it's even more true in when, when, when people can leave you whenever they, want, whenever they like, you know? If people are flexible, working on their own, if they want need them to stick to your project, it's because you've got something to say that the others don't, uh, don't, you know, don't have to say. It's, it's the difference between a leader and, and a manager. Uh, you've got to be a leader to have people around you uh, supporting your projects and, and working like, like they don't work with the, like, with the others for your project. And I think actually it's the, the contrary. If, if, it's, not, it's not about values as you just write in a paper and that is printed in, in, some, in some leaflets that are distributed to, to employees that don't even believe in these words and that are actually disgusted by the fact that it's written and it's not applied. I think, I think when you can leave, uh, it's like in a relationship. When you can leave when, whenever you want, it's a bit different. You know? You've got to stick to your values and words have to have a meaning. Well, I just read recently that, that, uh, that teams do their best work, do their best collaborative and creative work often over food. And so I think with that, it's time for lunch. So <laughs> have a hand of applause for our panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening.